but the Library Society and tonight's program have some threads. It was started in 1748 by 19 young people who could not afford to have libraries of their own. And so they pooled their resources because they were really intellectually curious individuals who wanted to keep up with the latest books, manuscripts, science, math, you name it, in England. And so they pooled their money and established relationships. They essentially, the Library Society's board essentially did what Zibby does in terms of finding out what's the most current way of dealing with topics, just what the best books are, and then sharing those views with young mothers. Well, that's what the library did for the 1748 and onward communities of providing the best books. And of course, we have one of the best authors on the planet with Zippy tonight, Paula. And so with that attempted analogy, I will say that the Library Society, which is the second oldest circulating library in America, and the oldest cultural institution in the South, is really, really psyched to have a modern interpretation of what we've been trying to do for 274 years. So I turn it over to our head librarian, Laura Mina, who is a mom herself and understands why it helps to have somebody like Zibby in our world. Thank you. Good evening to everybody. Thank you for being here, um, especially if you are a mom and you have young ones at home, um, which I am. And thank goodness I have somebody to watch him tonight. Um, this year has been full of challenges, but in the midst of all the challenges, I've discovered some really great bright spots, one of which is Zibby's book. And opportunities like this to meet you, Zibby, and you, Paula, here at a Zoom event, which otherwise wouldn't be happening with you two being up where you are in other parts of the United States. Um, Zibby, I was introduced to you through um, somebody in your family and it I remember she had, she sent us the book as a as a gift and I thought that the book was coming to me as a um because of how much she's been supportive of me as a mom and I said this is this is an incredible book and I loved right off the bat like just the the bite size pieces of of literature that I was or or creative writing that I was just able to kind of eat during my lunchtime, you know? Um, and it, I found out that you were related to somebody who's very important to me and very important to the Charleston Library Society community. Um, and so here you are tonight. And Paula, my own, you know, connection is, you know, I was discussing with you earlier the, when we had our very first book club event during my tenure here, your book Circling the Sun was the focus of it. And ever since you have been producing books, you know, during that tenure, I make sure that I get multiple copies of your books because everybody wants them and everybody mm -hmm. borrows them. And, you know, I think, you know, from the Paris wife to Love in the Love in the Ruins or to Love in Ruin. Um, to Circling the Sun, to your most current book, you know, getting these books in house has been imperative as part of collection development for us. Mm -hmm. And it's such an honor for us to have you here tonight in conversation. And I just, just from our earlier conversation, I look forward to hearing the two of you talk and the rapport that you both naturally have. And I know that our audience is going to really enjoy this evening's event. Um, if you have questions during the for when we have the Q and A this evening, please do send them to either Charleston Library Society um, post in the chat, and we will ensure that we ask those questions um, in the second half of our event this evening. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Paula and Zibby. Thank you again for being here with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 
Thank you for sure. having us. Do you mind if I put like the little spotlight here on uh, now that I'm a, let's see if I can see, is that better a little bit? Um, let's see, add spotlight. Is that better? Yeah, there yeah. we are. Okay, great. Um, I feel like I'm a Zoom, somewhat of a Zoom expert after this year. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you are because I'm just, I'm just not tech savvy and I don't want to be my 14 year old son as the person who comes in and sort of tricks me out, right? You need this mic and it has to be plugged in this way. And then you have to go into your settings and do this. And, you know, you help me figure out all the lighting and all, you know, they do it. They just naturally do it. And my 14 year old twins have been helping me on TikTok. Um, so uh, <laughs> the greatest was some random person highlighted my TikTok account, which has like three followers is like a book talk account to follow. And I texted it to my twins and I was like, you guys, look, this is amazing. And they were like, yay. So anyway, um, so just FYI for anybody here who doesn't know Paula McLean and her work, When the Stars Go Dark is a current New York Times bestselling book, which you must run out and either get from the library or buy or whatever. It is so, so good. And um, it's a, it's a, a new genre uh, for Paula. She had not written something quite so mysterious. And, I crossed uh, over to the dark side, yes. Over, um, thriller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but um, you have now set a new bar, um, set the bar high for everyone else trying to do this exact type thing. So um, everybody write this down and go get it and everything. So Thank just, you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Awesome. And then, by the way, this is my book. <laughs> Moms don't have time to, um, which is a collection of essays by uh, 60 people, 60 amazing authors who have been on my podcast, which is called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Um, and the reason I even did the book is because all the authors like Paula, who I've interviewed, we would have these great conversations. And at the end, I was like, well, I really wanted to know more about this. Or like, wow, I would love for Paula to write more about, you know, growing up the way she did and her relationships as a result of this or like to build on her New York Times article about sexual abuse or whatever. Anyway, so I went after a bunch of the authors and said, hey, would you want to write on these topics? Um, and I just did a blast email to the 300 or so authors I had had a year ago. Um, and the people who said yes ended up in this book. <laughs> so that's sort of how it came to be. But anyway. So well, I think that you do have a um, gift with making connections and drawing, I don't know, significant, I just, you know, the, we met when I did your podcast, but when was that? Before even when the Stars Go Dark came out and just instantly I knew that I had found a kindred spirit in the, just in the way, immediately we just started talking about books and just had a rich rewarding, significant conversation. And I don't think, I mean, I just, I don't like small talk. I, I, I find it exhausting. I, the reason I love to talk about books with people who love books is it always leads you to a place of really, I think, trying to get to the bottom of what we're doing here, like as humans, like what we're up to as humans because that's what books do for us right sort of holds up a mirror to human experience and when we love a character it's because we recognize them right and when we love a story it's because it feels true to us right even if it's set in outer space so yeah, yeah. anyway yeah. i think you're enormously gifted Oh, and I think you're enormously yeah, gifted. <laughs> really gifted, really gifted. Um, I'm really curious, actually, about how you got into interviewing authors like this. Like, what led you to that particular entry point? I'm curious. Um, thank you for the question. It was so random that I even started doing this. Um, I've always loved to read, always. From the time I could read, I was, I just always had a book in my hand, um, probably like you, like loving to read. And um, I also loved to write. And so after I got divorced, which was about six years ago, 
I suddenly had a lot more time. I have four kids of my own and um, all of a sudden I had these weekends without the kids, which were like gutting um, to me. It just like, I was crying so much and it was like a really hard adjustment um, to not have them after like being so in it for so many years. Um, so I had all this time. So I was like, well, now I can pick up some of the things I didn't used to have time for, like reading and writing more essays. And I had always written, but um, not so much lately. So I started writing a lot more parenting essays on the weekends off. And I had the perspective and the sleep to be able to, <laughs> to do something that made sense. Um, and I really, I wrote this one article called A Mother's Right to Sanity for Huff Post that went viral about um, how I had just like, I just gotten fed up. And like, I got one last email about the preschool teachers needing empty toilet paper rolls. And I was like, that's it. I cannot. I can just stop. And like also that I had had a lot of kids in my life because I love kids and I, I wanted to have a lot of kids to spend time with them. And there was so much work around the kids and paperwork and emails and whatever that I was often being like, wait, hold on, let me just finish this. Um, anyway, I wrote that article. It inspired me to write a lot more articles. And then it inspired my husband one night to say, you should make a, you should try to put a book together of all these essays that you've been writing. And I said, Ugh, like moms don't have time to read books. And then I thought, oh, that's so funny. I'll use that as the title of my of my book. Um, and then I started talking to the few friends I had in the publishing world who said, nobody is going to find that funny in the publishing world. <laughs> um, <laughs> and a girlfriend of mine took me out to lunch. I actually just reminded her of this over the weekend because she didn't even remember doing this. But we went out to coffee and she said, you know, I'm really good at figuring out what everybody in the world like should be doing as a job. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, so she's like, I don't know if this book idea is the right thing, but I don't know, let me think about it. And then like a few days later, passing me at school drop off, she said, I think you should start a podcast. And I was like, well, what's a podcast? Like, why would I start? <laughs> like, I don't listen to podcasts. Honestly, I still don't listen to podcasts really. Um, and I was like, well, if I were to start a podcast, I could use that title, this like abandoned funny title, um, Moms Have Time to Read Books. So then what would that podcast be like? What would that be about? Um, and at first I thought, I'll just read those essays that I'm constantly forwarding to people. I wasn't really on social media, so I hadn't started posting on Facebook or now I can easily share articles, but I would like rip them out and like mail them. <laughs> and, like, um, so I was like, well, I'll just start reading those essays or I'll read, you know, a passage of this book when I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys have to read this because I get very excited about everything. Like mm -hmm. when I read a book I want to shout that I love, I want to shout it from the rooftops, which I'm essentially doing now every day. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And I found out that was illegal to read all those things, um, but that perhaps I could go right to the authors. And I knew about three authors and I was like, well, I guess I'll just start with them and see what happens. Um, and I've always loved talking to people. I was a psychology major. I wanted to be a psychologist. Um, you know, when the air conditioning guy comes over, you know, by the time he leaves, I know about his wife's infertility problems. Like I'm giving him a doctor referral. I'm just like that kind of person. I don't know why. I'm like really, yeah. really curious. No, it's, about it's, been, it's been the energy is connective. It's connective and it's, you know, driven to meet people on a plane of familiarity, of warmth and humor and familiarity. I don't know. That's my sense. And I think it's, I'm not surprised to know that you were a psychology uh, major in college because I can see that that is driving you as a reader too. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you also were a psychology major. <laughs> what, what did you major in? Unofficially, unofficially. I majored in English and history, which now makes sense. Yes. Um, being you know, trafficking in the historical novel, but it's just something I've always been fascinated by, like why people do what they do. And I think that's what drives me as a writer, but it's also what drives me as a person. And maybe some of it is my childhood. You know, I grew up in foster care with a lot of loss and displacement and, um, and uncertainty, there was so much uncertainty. And one thing that we know is that kids who have a lot of uncertainty tend to project what they think might be happening 
and to read, they learn to read. Do you have friends like that? Or did you grow up that way where you learn to, to read people based on their body language, what they're saying, what they're not saying, what they're holding back. And then that is, I mean, to me, I have an unofficial degree in psychology. Right? <laughs> That's always, in fact, I can't, I used to write, I wrote The Paris Wife in a Starbucks near my house in Cleveland. But, and that was fun. My kids were really little then. Um, I had two kids under four and a teenager at home. And my husband worked all the time and I never had time to myself. And I also couldn't compartmentalize. Maybe you're good at it. Um, you found this time once your kids were spending time with their dad on the weekends, but I had to like, I had to get out of my house, even if they were like upstairs and there was a sitter and somebody else was in charge, I couldn't turn it off, the mom thing. I couldn't turn it off and I couldn't stop listening for them. And I couldn't stop thinking I was supposed to be making a grilled cheese or whatever. So I went and I wrote in a Starbucks near my house in Cleveland. And that's where most of the Paris wife was written. Wow. And I just hadn't been alone with my thoughts. It was, um, and of course I was transporting myself to Paris every day too. So it was like going on vacation, but also doing a deep dive into these people's consciousnesses. And it did, it felt like it felt euphoric. It honestly did. But I tried to write the next book in a coffee shop too. And by that point, I realized that I paid way, way, way too much attention to what everybody else was doing around me and listening to other people's conversations or, so now I can't, now I can't do that. Um, <laughs> now I can't do that. I thought you were going to say you paid too much in coffee, like that you- <laughs> Oh, I was really good at that. Like when I wrote The Paris Wife, I was dead broke. Like like really, really broken. I'd been broke for a long time. Like I knew how to live that way. So I had a scheme, right? I would go into the Starbucks at whatever first thing in the morning and I would buy my one tall dark roast coffee for $1.48 or $2.48 or whatever it was. And I would basically, I'd rented that chair, I thought for at least four hours, if not six hours until it was time to go pick them up from, from daycare, so. And then school, and that's sort of how I made my way. Um, how old are your kids now? Um, I have twins who are about to be 14, and I have a six and seven year old. So um, I feel like I was more like you with my older kids. I felt very guilty all the time, and it was hard to shut it off. And now I'm, <laughs> I'm like, whatever, <laughs> whatever. It's gonna be okay. Um, but to be honest, I feel like I'm actually kind of a better parent at this point because um, I'm not as on top of them as I was my older kids. But um, I also think, and I don't know, I, I, I'm assuming your kids feel the same way. Um, you know, they're really into what I'm doing now, right? So, and they can see it. Like, you know, you wrote your book, you have a book in your hand, like I do a podcast, they can listen to the podcast and now I have a book or whatever. But like, it's not, I'm not sitting at my desk working on financial models, right? It's it's something so concrete mm -hmm. for kids. Mm -hmm. um, they like to read, I like to read, I talk to the author, I talk to authors of their books. So um, it feels somewhat collaborative uh, in a way. I make sure they're a part of every decision. Like, what about this logo? What do you think about that? Like we talk mm -hmm. about it at dinner. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's fun to involve them. There was a time when my daughter, who's now 16, was about eight or nine when she got really resentful, like once the Paris wife came out and kind of changed my career and suddenly I was traveling for work, she got very um, possessive and a little bit snooty with me. And she just thought, you know, well, why are you doing this? This doesn't make sense to me. Why don't you just work in a bank or something? And then you then you have normal hours and you're a normal person and you're not, you know, leaving all the time and I, and I totally get that. But now that she's 16, she both understands that I'm home way more, right? Way more than if I worked at a bank, right? I don't work nine to five. I'm always here to do the drop off and the pick up and the whatever and to have all the friends over and take them to various places or before COVID. Um, but now she also, because she's a big reader and she's a writer, now she, 
gets it, you know? She gets it and she wants to have a creative life herself and has a new, I don't know, respect, I suppose, even though she's 16 and she's supposed to be whatever, right? Rolling her eyes and not talking to me. <laughs> but in fact, she said of this latest book, you know, finally I have a book I can recommend to my friends. <laughs> You know, and she had me come in and talk to her class. She's actually, yeah, she's, she feels more and more like an ally. And it sounds as if your kids are really allies for you right now. They can see what you're doing and support what you're doing. And it's not always easy, right, for women to do work that they love and that feeds and nourishes them. Like that's a win for the whole family, right? Because then you have more to give back. I mean, I think this speaks to what you and I were speaking about sort of before this started, which is how you were asking me, like, how do I fit it all in? And I think that essentially that's the same question that all of us have to answer every single day. Yeah. Everybody, no matter who you are, you get the time you get and you have to figure mm -hmm. out how to spend it in the best way and then you get to do it all over again the next day mm -hmm. and how do you get to squeeze in all the different things so I often feel like okay well if I'm gonna do this like whose time is this coming out of right am I I'm, I'm not willing to take this out of the kids time am I taking it out of my time with my husband am I taking it out of my sleep or am I taking it out of my exercise, which is usually like, yes, I'm taking it out of there. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> that. That's usually where Same. it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, it's a, you know, it's a finite asset, right? You can only draw down. So where does that leave us? And what are those decisions that, you know, your life ends up being the sum total of all of those little decisions that you make every day with how to spend your time. Um, so whether you're writing or running to the coffee shop or picking up the kids, like, I don't know, there's the guilt, but then, um, you know, I love that writing is something that can fit in so easily to everything else. Like whenever I'm doing anything, like I don't, I feel like I don't, now that they're back in school, thank goodness I have time during the day. <laughs> but it was like, you know, I'd be sitting on the ground with my laptop while they would play around me. And that's like when I could write an essay or I would, yeah. you know, I'm, I, I often am standing at the kitchen island, like in the morning, you know, like making lunch and like flipping. Uh -huh. through. It's like, what, what choice do you have? It's like, you, you just do it all. Because that's the time that you have. I feel like COVID has really challenged me to stop feeling so precious about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it used to be that I couldn't write when they were in the house. They had to be away at school, but then suddenly they were home all the time. And so either I was going to find a way to work with them in the house or I wasn't going to work. And that was not an option. So I feel like it was good for all of us. I feel like I loosened up more and, and I probably am. What you said earlier is really interesting to me about how you're probably a better parent now, right? I think there was a time where I was more kind of on top of everything or feeling like there was pressure to do it all right, to be, to do it all perfectly. And if I wasn't completely on top of it, what was happening in school? And what do you mean you got a C minus on the math test? And shouldn't we write the teacher right away? And what happens if we don't? And there's this idea, I feel, that we're driven to feel like we need to be on top of absolutely every aspect of our life, which is not possible. And it's not, it's not humane. So yeah, what matters? And then what does it cost? Yep. You know, what are you willing to pay? Right? And I think the having enough of a sense of humor that like none of this stuff like, I don't know, you've gone through a lot of stuff. I've had like a lot of loss in my life. You've had a lot of trauma and stuff that you've talked about. I'm sure a lot you haven't talked about. And I don't know, it just makes all the other things like, you know, mm -hmm. I was emailing the teachers about something today and I was just like, you know, like, sorry to be like a middle-aged meddler this morning, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, really like, you know, they don't need to be hearing from me and like, you know, but I have to send this stupid email and I don't know. It's just like, there are so many things that are so upsetting and so sad and, um, you know, for my book, um, I, my 
husband's mother, my mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law both passed away from COVID and this, my mother-in-law battled, had like a six week horrific illness that so we sorry. were in charge of like remotely, right? She was in Charlotte yeah. and we were actually, she lived in Charleston for a long time, as did my husband and a bunch of his friends and my sister-in-law and everybody. Um, so uh, they were like so tickled that I was doing this event tonight. And by the way, the family member is my Aunt Jenny, who um, lives in Charleston now. So I was delighted she gave this. But um, uh, anyway, all to say, um, you know, life is life is short. And um, when you have that perspective sort of at the top of your mind every day, then other things become, then you're more likely to have the like dance party with the kids when really they're supposed to be in the bath five minutes earlier. Right. So. Right. So to me, I feel like, and something I read recently, I don't know if you read this Adam Grant essay in the New York Times about COVID and the mood of this entire year of 2021 is um, like a malaise, like a fatigue. Language. Because, mm -hmm, exactly because we're so distracted and we're distracted because we're worried and we're worried because we have lots of reason to worry, right? But with our tension being pulled in all these various ways, we just feel dread all the time. And what we're missing, the opposite of that is flow. And I guess that's a question I have for you about, because for me, that's the key. When I'm in a place where I'm absolutely in tune with the work that I'm doing, with the book that I'm writing, connected to the characters, connected to the story, there is no sense of time. My favorite thing is looking up and four hours have passed and I don't know where I've been because I've been outside of time. And isn't that that sense of of flow and it's the opposite of what you're talking about, like trying to steal these moments, right? So I guess, how do you deal with moments when you're not inspired or what happens when you are inspired or how do you do your work anyway? Well, I think writing work is different than reading and analysis and yeah. that kind of prep work. Um, I am writing a memoir now that I just sold, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's called The Book Messenger. And congratulations, uh, yeah. Finding my voice again through books and all that stuff. Um, but I've been trying to figure out how to fit that in, and I, I cannot do it in like 20 minute increments. Like, <laughs> I, have to go back. I have to see like where I was in the story and what should come next. And it's like, no, no, no. Like, I cannot, I can't handle it the same way. I can handle like reading a chapter because I quickly remember where I am in someone else's book, or I can, you know, skim through some sort of. I don't know, self-help book or whatever I'm prepping. Um, so that's not hard. And I don't need flow for that, right? You don't need flow necessarily to read. Yeah. Although, I mean, it's better if you have more time. But it's better, I, yeah. It's better. But I can still read an essay and, you know, five minutes later, move on to something else. But yeah, writing, I've decided I have to do in big blocks of time. And um, uh, I'm doing it in the mornings when I don't have those two weekend mornings, four weekend mornings a month when I don't have the kids, that's when I'm going to get it done. <laughs> and I'm going to just like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and that's, you know, I think editing, I might be able to do more with them around um, tinkering, you know, the tinkering mm -hmm. and the playing, but yeah. um, not getting it all out of my brain. Um, yeah. Right. Getting it onto paper. You do have to feel a kind of freedom, I think and an unboundedness to it, at least for me. Like when I'm accumulating a book and that's what it feels like I'm doing. I said to someone in an interview this week, like her question is, well, how do you find that flow? And I said, well, I do my work, right? I sit down every day and I'm determined to be very blue collar about it, even if inspiration doesn't come and to, pour the words into the book and they start to accumulate. And when I get to a hundred pages of something, then it starts to feel real. And I remember I used to um, print it out so that I could hold it. That's still a really big deal to 
know that it's building something. And then you start to trust that it has a body, that it has integrity. And if you pour your love into something at a certain point, it seems to me, it's going to love you back. And to me, that's what happens with a book. Like I decide it's almost devotional. I'm going to pour my soul into this book and trust that it's all going to come together somehow. And at a certain point, it'll feel, it'll just feel right. You know, there's a trust. It's almost like a relationship. It's almost like a relationship that you're really building trust between yourself and this book that you're writing. So when you write, when, when you're in that, phase of just getting it down are you making how much effort do you put towards making the sentences sound mm, great versus yeah. getting the thoughts down because stopping to make the sentences great is slowing it down right it like slows down the translation yes. it's almost like putting it in another language right it's like as if I was writing in French I would have to like <laughs> it's two hats there's the the more immersive um, creating, right? That, that the energy of making is very different from the energy of editing. And so like when I used to teach, I used to tell my students, never ask when you're writing something, if it's good. Like never, when you're making anything, when you're making a sandcastle, don't ask if it's good, just play. Like just have that sense of play, but there is a tension, right? There is a tension when you start to realize, for instance, when you write a sentence that feels like it does have like a depth or a dimension or an energy and it's, it's touching something, it's igniting something interesting. And then suddenly you want to bring the rest of your paragraph up to that level. And then there you are with your editor's hat on and it sneaks in and there you are and the whole morning's gone and you've just been toying with a paragraph. Well, you can't write a book that way, right? So it's a constant struggle. But, but maybe if you make each paragraph sort of perfect as you go, then at the end, <laughs> you won't have to go back for as long. I don't know. I, you know, Wouldn't I, that be nice? <laughs> do you have, I'm interested, do you have bad habits as a writer or, or habits that you wish you didn't have? Um, I don't know. What, what, how would you answer that? Well, I think it's what we're talking about. If I have a bad habit as a writer, it's that I love language so much that it's really hard sometimes for me not to fixate on it. I mean, I got my start as a poet and there's something that's still very strong in me to make a sentence beautiful or to make it even musical, right? To reach for images and to have a sense that, this, that the sentence itself is alive. Mm -hmm. And, but I will get stuck. And sometimes I say it's like wallpapering a room that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you have this. And in fact, I did it with the Paris wife. I do it all the time you know, I'll work and work and work and work to make this opening chapter perfect. And then it never lives in the book. It never exists. Or it's, it's one, you know, paragraph at the end of the book or some or something, because we don't know at the beginning, the shape that the book itself will take or where it will lead us. The idea is almost like it's this the energy of the book is a piece of string or a magic carpet or something that's pulling you in to a, it's pulling you into a world that starts to have integrity. If you follow it, then the words are building to create this book. But one pretty sentence at a time, yeah. that's challenging. <laughs> you know? I interviewed um, the author of Hamnet. Have you read Hamnet? It's I have, and people are talking about that I book, know, Maggie O'Farrell kept talking about it and I was like, eh, I don't know. It doesn't, I mean, it just doesn't sound like something I'd be into. So I didn't read it and I didn't read it. And then um, I was like, okay. And then they pitched me for the podcast and I was like, well, everyone else is reading it. Maybe it's good. <laughs> and? Um, so it's so good. It's really? like okay. so good. Um, and I'm like, I'm a moron. Like people are all reading it because it's like 
beautiful and interesting and dark and like so immersive and like you so know it's about like, it's about Shakespeare right it's a historical it, it mm -hmm. is but barely I mean yes it is but it's really about what it's like to to lose a child and mm -hmm. um the impact of that on a family and um you know with like this abusive sort of grandfather and um it was so good but anyway when I interviewed Maggie O'Farrell she said um her advice is never to start at the beginning that when you're doing a project like a novel start start in the middle i'm writing this down <laughs> right? it's such good advice because she's like you know you never actually you really don't even know you don't know where the beginning is so don't even try just start in the middle and get going i don't know i loved that advice i love it i love it and in fact i'm working on a new book right now Ooh. and struggling beginnings are hard for me i mean i guess that's why i wanted to know which you haven't divulged by the way what your do you have bad habits I mean, there I was, I told you all about mine. My bad habits. I have so many bad habits, but I don't know what my bad writing habits are. Um, I mean, I think it's not, I don't know if it's a bad habit, but I, I just like get in my own head way too much about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like this isn't good or where's this going or this is relevant mm -hmm. or how am I going to do this? Or I, I, you know, I just like, I have all these, like, I'm trying to, turn the car on and it's just like sputtering um and i i can't like get it going um mm -hmm. and i waste all this time on that um yeah and then, uh, finally i've had to i've had to trick myself like most days when i start i trick myself and say um i actually put in all caps like draft one of three <laughs> Because I was like, well, if it's not the final draft, it doesn't matter if it's bad. You know? I, and I finally got love started. It. I love it. I, w I told a friend once, and I think about this sometimes, that I'm sneaking up on the day's writing like a lion in the belt, you know, like if I sneak up on it, if I pretend, you know, that I'm just, it's just a draft or, or whatever, then I won't put that pressure on it to be to sing immediately, it's only the accumulation. And at a certain point, so I try to write a thousand words a day when I'm accumulating, when I'm in the making part of a book and it's a trick. And in fact, I keep track of my, I'll show you, I keep track of my word count every day. You oh, know? Wow. Um, and Hemingway used to do that. And it's a trick I stole from Hemingway, but I'll tell you that what it does is it's almost like it feels more concrete. It feels more concrete. I can look at the numbers and it also feels devotional. Like here's the day I sat down, I did my work. I did my work. And so now I can relax and the rest of the day can feel free. And if you write a thousand words a day, I'm telling you that at a certain point, you stop thinking about the sentences and it just starts to build, you know? <laughs> so I'm in that place now. And it sounds like you are too. Wait, what is your new book about? Um, well, I can't tell you because I haven't sold it yet. And it's, I'm really just getting started. But, you know, something really interesting happened to me when I switched genres, which was an accident. I just this character, this detective, missing persons expert came to me essentially and hijacked my entire career. Um, <laughs> but it was so exciting to feel for the first time in a decade that I could, that I had an entirely fictional heroine and that I could pour into the book in a really unmediated way, my own obsessions. And that the three historical novels that I've done in the last decade, although I've loved them insanely, and the process of writing them has felt just like it's been a passion project. And yet there's something now that there's just so much freedom in my creative life. It's like the whole ceiling has blown off and I don't have this biographical tether of taking the facts of a life and trying to make sense of them. It's like getting a box of puzzle pieces and saying, okay, so who is Beryl Markham or who is, you know, who is um, Hadley Richardson and how did she get to be that way? It's, it's more, I don't know. It's freaking fun is what it is. <laughs> I'm, 
having fun. And so I think I'm going to continue in this vein for a while. I mean, I'm 55, I have eight books behind me, but in another way, I feel like I'm just getting started, right? That I have a lot of energy right now to work. And so maybe some of my kids are older. I wonder about that. Do you feel that you have more, so the time that you had at the beginning was only on these weekends, but now as they're getting older, do you feel like your life is expanding a little bit? Um, yes. And by the way, it sounds like if you're having fun, by the way, writing, like it comes through, like you can tell reading a book if the author yeah. is just like doing it mm-hmm. or loving it, like it, yeah. you can tell, um, it's, I feel like it's the difference, like your historical novels are like you were renovating a house and now <laughs> you're building one from scratch, right? You've like, <laughs> You bought land and now you're like, you it's know. not fixer upper. It's not a fixer upper. We're no. blowing it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like when you're so in the weeds, it's very hard to think straight. Um, you know, I, I could tell moms this, but no one will believe no one believes anybody and you know, you have to learn it yourself, right? Like, but I really do feel like five and under is very, very hard to get anything. Yeah really done um and at least a shower right (laughs) yes it's just hard it's hard um I think also the fear right because there's like you have to make sure your kids are alive and okay and like you know there's there's like now I feel I mean I I shouldn't say anything but I don't have to watch them to make sure they're gonna not fall down the stairs right like that whole pressure has been lifted I they can take their own showers they can like you know they're, they're much more independent. So, um, so the, so a lot of my anxiety has been lifted from that. I mean, it's still around. I just keep moving it. You know, the anxiety cloud just, you know, <laughs> it just goes on new it's places. Sticky. But, uh, it's sticky. It'll attach yeah, to yeah. anything. <laughs> I, I have a theory though, at least for me, when my kids were really young and all I could do when my now 16 year old was a baby was lay on the couch pinned under her body and watch episode after episode of ER until I was quite sure that I, I really sometimes think I have a medical degree because I watched so much (laughs) ER in a row. And I was working, I was teaching, but it's very different than the energy it takes to write. But I wonder about this. My question is, do you think that one of the challenges for young moms is that you become absorbed in your children's lives and you kind of lose yourself. Yeah, of course. You don't really have a self. And in order to be a writer, you're writing from a place, right? You're giving that voice. So I don't don't know, but I'd be interested to hear what you think about when your kids were really little, did you ever feel like you weren't like a person really, like you were a, a mom person, but not like yourself. Um, yes, um, I did feel like that. I, um, particularly as a first time mom, I, I, my experience was so different because I had six years between my twins and my second sort of batch of kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but with my second, like when my, third child was born I remember like like you I would go to Penn Cotidia and not Starbucks but whatever um and I would sit there and write while I had an hour or two in the morning at like a coffee shop even just about like the day I stopped nursing my third child who I thought at the time would be my last child and like the sadness of that and like you know every so often I would kind of check in with myself with like a short essay or something but um but yeah it's really hard I mean yeah, it's just uh, and the exhaustion and you have like a lot stacked against you. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the same time, you're you're doing really important work that's like not highly valued necessarily every day, right? You're dealing with your kids and and I, I don't know, it's 
I, I'm, I love kids. I love, oh my gosh, I was at like this event and then there was a baby and I was like, give me the baby. <laughs> oh my God. In fact, all the moms there started like fighting over this random baby. And I was like, this is weird of me. Like, this is really weird that I'm holding this baby. <laughs> I don't want to give it back, you know? And I'm like, and then every mom sort of like went around and started like immediately yeah. doing their thing. Like some moms started like bouncing like this and I'm walking like, <laughs> back and forth. Do you ever find you do it like you see a, a mom with a baby in an elevator and she's doing it and suddenly like you're rocking back and forth yes. that kind of rhythm <laughs> of rocking it's like in your body and it doesn't quite leave but it's funny to me you know when I wrote my first novel I was here in Cleveland my kids were like super super little in fact even when my daughter was an infant and I was pregnant with my son I would um I would waddle up to the library near my house and I had an hour a day. And it took me five years to write my first novel because I had an hour a day. But I can tell you that that hour a day was incredibly precious to me because that was the place that I attached to not just who I was as a writer, but that I could fall into this world that I was building. And it really reminded me of the kind of reader I was when I was a kid, that I was always looking for that story, usually in libraries, like up against a wall at the back of the stack somewhere, waiting to be swept away, like wanting to fall into this world, you know? I love that, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Do you have a seminal library story or a first book that you ever loved? Um, well, libraries, like every summer, my mom, we would go back and forth to our local library with this big tote bag that she had. And it would like sit by the door and we would st stuff in as many picture books as we could. And then we'd bring them home and then I'd like, Ch -ch -ch -ch, and then we'd put them back in and go back to the library. And we like kept doing this over and over and I would keep a list of all the books that I would read. And actually, I found that list recently in the same sort of, I think it was from my school, like this brown, hard back thing. And um, now I'd like want to go back and get all those books again. But um, that's no, so I sweet. Love the like you found the list. Yeah. Uh, it's all like in my little script from when I was young. And, beautiful is that? Yeah, I should post I love it. it. <laughs> I love it. It reminds me of the, um, is it Joan Didion who has the quote? that we should be on nodding terms with our former selves hmm. and that there's something about saving. And I know we're always like, particularly now that we have so much stuff we're throwing out, but every once in a while, I think that's, that's treasure. Like that's precious that you have this connection with your early reader, right? I think there are clues. The first book or one of the first books that I remember reading and just inhaling when I was in, in second grade was a biography of Annie Oakley. Hmm. And it's like, why that? Like why <laughs> it wasn't even a, it wasn't really even a story. It was about her life. And yet I was absolutely 100% absorbed in that story. But now when I think back, like you ever like piece through, like, what are the, what are the through lines? It's like the writer who wants to like, completely immerse herself in the details of Martha Gellhorn is also the person who wanted to immerse herself in the life of Annie Oakley, you know? Yeah. What? Well, should we open it up for some questions? I feel like I went totally over with uh, us just chit-chatting, which I had a feeling I would do. <laughs> because no, it's really fun. been, it's really been fun, so. I have to say my first book that I really fell into was Charlotte's Web. And I remember finishing it like in the bathroom at night after my mom had, my parents had put me to bed already. And I like turned on the light and went in. And I remember just sitting there and crying. Crying. And then I was like, wow, books can make you cry. I was like, this is amazing. I love this. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that kind of hooked me. No, they can't. Books can make you cry. And sometimes I want my money back if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> This has been so incredible to be able to listen to both of you talk about these experiences. There are some questions that I'd like to ask you from the audience, but um, I want to tell you one of my wild library stories that just happened here at the Charleston Library Society. Um, my elementary and then middle and then high school librarian walked through the doors 
here at the Library Society for a tour, became a member, and I can still tell you that she was the person that touched off my mm -hmm. love of reading. And the book that she touched off, she had passed to me was Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. And I, I, I like, it made me have the feels and that yeah. is the power of literature, you know? And yeah. so libraries are magical. <laughs> For sure. uh, so Zibby, what, um, one of the things that we're so intrigued by is this concept of like, you know, the finite amount of time, right? That we have available to us. I love the way that you described, you know, um, giving certain amounts of things, certain amounts of time and being like, it, I get this sense that you're, you're a realist about it. And, um, but that allows you also to kind of flex and flow between the different areas of your life. Um, so a question kind of along these lines is, are most of your readers and your listeners your age and young mothers, or have you found that the like moms don't have time to concept applicable for all of us, especially now with COVID. I think it's been applicable to everyone. I do think that the moms with the really young kids don't necessarily have time to even listen to the podcast um, <laughs> or read the books. I think they would like to, um, but like my virtual book club, for instance, um, there are a lot of empty nesters and um, women who do have more time. Um, I feel like a lot of women feel like they want to adopt me or something. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> they're very proud of me and it's so cute and I love that. Um, but there are a lot of women at all different ages um, you know, my like Instagram followers or whatever, they span, you know, the range, but the ranges, but I think it's mostly like sort of 20, 20 late twenties to 50 or something, right? It's all in that range. Um, yeah, not everybody has time. <laughs> well, I was listening to your most recent podcast um, this morning, um, my time for podcasting, talking on the phone, and basically connecting with the outside world seems to be while I'm driving, which some people might think might be unsafe. <laughs> anyway, it is. But um, Zibi, one of the things that you had talked about was, or you touched upon was bibliotherapy and the um, that concept. Um, so Paula and Zibi, what are your thoughts on bibliotherapy and what is your, how did you use bibliotherapy, if at all, during the quarantine? Mm -hmm. Good question. I want to take it. You want me to take it? So an example, I think, of bibliotherapy for me during COVID was reading Catherine May's book, Wintering. Love that book. Love it. Absolutely love it. And I read it during the winter because I 100% needed to see that the process that we were being forced to go through, right, against our will, like doing all this stuff we didn't want to do was in fact a process and that, and that it could provide something for us a time to rest, a time to reset, a time to heal, a time to reflect and consider, and that there could be a use for it, for this hibernation or cocooning, cocooning in the same way that the butterfly inside the chrysalis is goo and yet is building something. Um, it was so helpful to me. So yeah, that's the example I would give. I think this is why I love reading memoirs um, because whatever I'm going through, when I read a memoir of someone who's gotten through something could be completely unrelated, right? A memoir of overcoming drug addiction or just anything, right? Any, I got through this and this is how yeah. I find so inspiring. And then I feel like I can glean all the tools that I need to get over whatever is going on in my life, even something minor, right? But memoirs for me are sort of how 
I learn to deal with the world, right? I People are like, oh, here, here's how I did it. And I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I had my own moment of uh, bibliotherapy walking down the street, like it, just like this golden moment of it. Um, and it was with George Saunders, most recent book, uh, Swim in the Pond in the Rain and his introduction where he talks about Steinbeck and he talks about um, like, you can get this sense of spirituality almost as he's, as he's writing his introduction. There's such the flow that you were talking about. There was so much of it. And thank goodness that people now walk around with air pods and earbuds and all the you know headphones in and stuff so it doesn't look completely crazy but I was literally talking to myself out loud saying oh, yes he gets it this is amazing and I was I I really if we didn't have cell phones would have totally looked like a crazy person talking to myself but it struck me so hard and so fast that I like I tracked down his email and I sent a message to him and said, I have to let yeah. you know that I started talking to myself on the street because of your book. Oh, wow. And he was really into that. So um, another question that's kind of like along these lines is what are the books on your nightstand and how do you choose them? Ooh. Uh, you wanna take that question? Well, my nightstand is sort of an extension of my podcast. I um, and how I choose books for my podcast is um, sorting through like the zillions of pitches I get, which are so amazing. And also going and looking and seeing what's coming out um, and like really like seeing what respond, what I respond to. Like I want to read the stuff I want to read. And sometimes when people, you know, with Hamnet, for instance, like I was saying earlier that, you know, well, sometimes I'm wrong, you know, <laughs> um, but uh I have to just want to read them. And I, I like reading across genres as well. I like, um, I read memoir is my favorite, but I also love fiction and, um, some thrillers and, you know, actually not I mean, sometimes. And, um, so my nightstand becomes whatever I've booked. I do seven podcasts a week. So it's whatever I've booked for the next week. I try to read before the week ends. Um, and I can't read every word of every book, but, um, in terms of like what I'm reading now, for instance, I'm reading um, uh, I'm reading Where the Grass is Green and the Girls are Pretty by Lauren Weisberger, who wrote The Devil Wears Prada, which is so, it's so far totally entertaining. Um, I'm also reading um, Notes from a Young Black Chef, which is a fantastic memoir uh, by Kwame Onwachi. I'm probably said, said that wrong. Um, and I just read um, Palace of the Drowned, a novel. Oh, I loved that. Did you? Yeah. I did. Um, I, she... I, when, it was, when it was pitched to me, I was like, ooh, I'll spend some time in Venice. Okay. I... <laughs> and she wrote Tangerine. Yes. Is, yeah. Set in Morocco and, and the then the, or something. The last yeah. one I read for this week um, is All the Colors Came Out, which is a father, a daughter, and a lifetime of lessons by Kate Fagan, who's a um, professional female basketball player about her dad who had ALS and who passed away um but like I love stories like that how she dealt with that and the love and oh my god I was crying so anyway that that's my nightstand of sorts how we come through hard things well I don't have time to read when I'm working on a book <laughs> because I'm steeping myself in research and I'm always reading for endorsements for other writers so the time that I have to read is like between books and it's really funny to see like where I start to like glut, you know, as a reader or, and, and, and I'm always looking for the book that's worth my time. And I used to feel guilty as a young reader, picking something up and then putting it down again. But now I'm merciless. Like if I'm not in, in 20 pages, if I have one chapter to read at night, but you know, after my kids go to bed and before I pass out, it better feed me right? It better be something that really, again, like takes me someplace immediately. So the two books that I'm reading right now that are fantastic, one is Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, which, you know, just hit the New York Times list this week and is absolutely completely brilliant and epic and ast astonishing, absolutely astonishing. And the other book that I'm reading is Joanne Tompkins' novel, What Comes After. Do you know this book, Sibby? 
No. Although Maggie Shipstead is going to be on my podcast on Thursday. So I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but no. heard it here. <laughs> um, did you love it? Yes. It was long though. I have to I say. know. It's very dense. It really kind of reminds me almost of like Amor Tolls or something that she's telling a big story and she's not in a hurry. Like she's really... It's so immersive or um, Kate Atkinson, like really deep, yeah. deep, deep, immersive story. Um, but what comes after? So the other thing I'm always reading for, because my own interest, particularly lately, is about trauma, how we heal from personal and collective trauma, how we move our lives forward after difficult things happen, how we find ourselves. It's sort of the same that you're talking about. We want to know how people come through, right? Um, it's about how after trauma, after a terrible event happens, what happens after that, how this community puts itself back together, how these parents put themselves back together and learn to love again and learn to trust again. And that's, it's kind of what I'm, what I like to read. Yeah, so, I love that. Yeah. yeah. I always find that hearing what other people whose minds I love being and as a result of, you know, as a result of reading, like I love knowing what they feed their own minds. And I think that's such an important and powerful experience is to like get those lists from the people who, mm. who, who's, whose words you love, you know, and um, that just, that's a beautiful note for us to end on. Um, I do want to say that Paula, your poet is still like alive and well, I think, because <laughs> when the stars go dark, circling the sun, um, the Paris wife, all of these titles, love and ruin, all of these titles, they're so poetic Thank and you. they, they just, yeah. they have this beauty to them. So it's alive and well, and very, I, I can't really yeah. help myself. So thank goodness it's still working for me. So. <laughs> and yeah. Zibby, I have to thank you for making the size of your essays and the size of your podcast just right so that I can read your essays and your pod and listen to your podcast so you you really do have mothers in mind <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the way you value I can't, time <laughs> I can't get through it myself like nobody like I don't have time to record a longer podcast so <laughs> no one's gonna have time to listen to a longer one it's great. Um, so uh, Buxton Books is our independent bookstore partner. Um, they live uh, on the first floor of the building we're in right now. And they do a great job collaborating with us. They have signed books um, of Zibby's and signed books of Paula's. Um, so when the Scar stars go dark is there's signed copies of that downstairs and there's signed copies of moms don't have time to anything any word you want in the blank right <laughs> um so <laughs> the link for purchase <laughs> beautiful the link for purchasing those books i put in the chat i'll put in the chat one last time but i also zibi i'd love for you to throw into the chat the um the link to your um Yes, the t-shirt that we had talked about earlier today and just kind of let people know that the where the proceeds go for the sales of your books. Yes, the proceeds all go. I'm putting it in the chat right now. Um, I'm going to stop secretly chatting with my aunt and uncle who are here <laughs> who don't even know I had it in the chat. Um, okay, um, well, this is um, this is the link to the Susan Felice Owens program, which um, my, as I mentioned, my mother-in-law passed away from COVID. And so we're funding this new vaccine through Mount Sinai where Medical Center in New York, which I'm on the board of. Um, and it's a low cost vaccine for third world na nations, which will be administered in one dose through the nose and can be stored at lower temperatures or higher temperatures rather. Um, and they're, they've passed animal trials, they're in human trials, they're getting very close. And so I've donated all the proceeds for my first book and my next book, which is coming out in November, which you can also pre-order already called Moms Don't Have Time to Have Kids. Um, and uh, both the proceeds for both those books will be going there. And there's a Citizens for Humanity uh, long sleeve t-shirt right now called Stay Safe, which you can wear, which has all sorts of like 
things on the back to remind people to wear masks and be safe and blah, blah, blah. And 100% of those proceeds are also going um, to the Susan Felice Owens program. And I will uh, put that in the, I will put that in the chat quickly as well. And when is your memoir slotted to come out? My memoir is going to come out um, next fall, 2022. 2022. And I have a children's book coming out in March of 2022. Called oh my goodness, lady. Coming. Yeah, from uh, Penguin Random House's imprint called Flamingo. And it's so cute. It's called Princess Charming. And um, I'm very excited about that too. <laughs> well, we would love to have you come back in person. And I can promise you won't have to write in chats to Ginny and Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I would love, I can't wait to start uh, traveling again. I'm like very excited here. Okay, oh, yeah, we right all now. miss it, but this has just been delightful. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Anne, for hosting us so graciously. Yes, and, thank um, you, everybody. Thanks to Ginny. <laughs> Thanks to Aunt Jenny for the introduction and for handing this book to Laura. And that's why we're all here. So thank you so much. Yeah, um, meant to be. It was meant to be. Absolutely. Paula, you're so gracious spending all this time with me and us and everybody. And thank you to the library. And thank you, everybody, for watching. It's so yeah, nice. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. We, we hope to see you in person very soon. We would love that. OK, everyone be well. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a great night. Okay. Thanks, Dan.